introducing well just we're waiting for the last people to sit down but i shall introduce uh, mark dexter mark nester is a neurosurgeon in australia he is the head of the adult and children westmeath uh, public hospital department he is also the head of the clinic associated with the West Mead, where all our New Caledonian patients go to. And he is our, somebody who has been working with New Caledonia for the past 20 years or so. I just um, for a short story, when I applied to come to New Caledonia, uh, one of the first things I did was I, I rang my colleague uh, who was here in Nemea, and I asked him how it was here in New Caledonia. He says, oh, that's not bad, but uh, there was an answer that was a little bit worrying for me. He said, in New Caledonia, my best colleague is actually in, New in Australia, and that's Mark Dexter. So I was a little bit worried for the quality of medicine here in New Caledonia. And in the end, well, it's true that after 20 years of working together with Mark Dexter, um, I know that he is extremely um relevant as a colleague is it's very important to work with him and i think we owe him a lot um he's always there to look after our neurosurgery uh he's been like this for years and years so we shall start this very first presentation the role of the neurosurgeon in the management of chronic pain or how um uh, neurosurgeons can ease chronic pain mark dexter you have the floor uh, thank you, Nicholas. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. Can everyone see the slides? So... Um, Thank you very much, Nicholas. Um, I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person. We still have some COVID-related issues here in Sydney, and uh, this year is more difficult. More, more of my colleagues have it than uh, the last two years, and we're still a little bit limited with travel. So I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person. The uh, past two years has been difficult. Normally, I would be in New Caledonia twice per year, and I enjoy those visits enormously, but uh, it's not been possible. So. Uh, I will try to do my best. Um, my thanks uh, sincerely to Luke Brune and Thierry de Gresland for asking me to participate in this uh, first pain management conference for Caledonia and the Pacific. It's a, it's a real honor to be asked to present and I hope I can share a few thoughts that may be uh, interesting. So what can neurosurgeons bring to the management of chronic pain? So there are a variety of procedures that we can uh, perform to assist in the management of chronic pain. Uh, neurosurgeons also have a role to play in the diagnosis and investigation of a variety of chronic pain syndromes. Uh, and these roles are usually of most benefit in the setting of a specialized multidisciplinary pain management team. And I've been fortunate not only in Sydney, but also in New Caledonia to work with a, a very uh, expert team of neurologists and pain management physicians. And I uh, hope that I've been able to assist some of the New Caledonian patients who have had a variety of chronic pain syndromes. Uh, to illustrate these roles, I thought it would be interesting to explore the neurosurgical management of trigeminal neuralgia. It's a condition that I'm uh, passionate about treating, and uh, we receive patients in Sydney, not just from New South Wales, but also from all over Australia to have this condition treated. And as you all know, it's uh, quite a disabling condition. So what can we do in neurosurgery? Well, we can perform a variety of ablative neurosurgical procedures that could be in the peripheral nervous system, in the spinal cord or in the central nervous system. Uh, we can perform peripheral nerve stimulation, spinal cord stimulation, motor cortex stimulation, deep brain stimulation, and then other procedures uh, specifically for uh, trigeminal neuralgia, such as microvascular decompression. Uh, we have a role in stereotactic radiosurgery or gamma knife, and also in intrathecal drug delivery. So this is just a brief uh, overview of one of the uh, concepts in treating facial pain. Uh, and as you can see, it's quite complex. And if I just draw your attention to the diagnosis line, 
there are a variety of conditions that can cause facial pain, including trigeminal neuralgia, trigeminal neuropathic pain, deafferentiation pain, uh, cancer facial pain, and a variety of neuralgias. And depending upon you know, the wishes of the patient, there are a variety of treatment options that we can bring. And these would include microvascular decompression, radiofrequency lesioning, balloon compression, stereotactic radiosurgery, peripheral nerve stimulation, rarely neurectomy, motor cortex stimulation, <clears throat> tractotomy, which is rarely performed, but sometimes very effective for people with terminal cancer facial pain, for example, due to involvement of the skull base with um, invasive skin cancers. Um, and then occasionally we just have a role in advising regarding medical therapy. So trigeminal neuralgia or tic doloro is um, a, a relatively common condition and something that is incredibly disabling for patients who suffer from this condition. It's a form of neuropathic pain in that it's a pain initiated or caused by a primary lesion or dysfunction in the central nervous system. What's unusual about trigeminal neuralgia is it's one of the forms of neuropathic pain that is often completely reversible. Um, it's thought to be due to a relatively minor demyelinating lesion of the trigeminal root, and it's barely enough to be detected by detailed qualitative sensory testing of facial sensation. It's in many cases caused or contributed to by vascular compression uh, at the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve, but there are certainly other causes that uh, can mimic trigeminal neuralgia. And we think that essentially we end up with a faptic or abnormal transmission of impulses within the trigeminal nerve that ultimately in many cases result from vascular compression of the nerve at its brainstem origin. So as you all know, trigeminal neuralgia is uh, typically a paroxysmal lancinating electrical shock-like pain that strikes people in the face in any of the divisions of the trigeminal nerve. And it usually lasts for a few seconds of intense pain and then it resolves. It's often triggered by sensory stimuli such as touching the face, facial movement, brushing the teeth, or even wind on the face. And it's always confined to the distribution of one or more branches of the trigeminal nerve. And it's almost uniquely isolated to one side of the face. Uh, in most patients, you cannot detect a neurological deficit or any facial sensory loss. And there's a tendency for spontaneous remissions. Uh, in the Australian community, its incidence is thought to be about four per 100,000 per year, but that's probably an underestimate in that many patients go undiagnosed for many years, as you all know. Um, in terms of the neurosurgical involvement in trigeminal neuralgia, probably the most crucial thing is making the diagnosis. And there are several red flags that we look for in taking the history that would suggest that perhaps this is another form of facial pain rather than trigeminal neuralgia. So if the pain is a burning, aching or constant pain, or if, in particular, if it's present at night, they would all make me think that perhaps this is not idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, if there are other structural symptoms, such as watering of the eye, swelling, uh, redness or rash on the face, then we think about some of the autonomic uh, cranial neuralgia, such as sunct or suna. Uh, if there are other neurological signs, such as facial weakness, deafness, or facial sensory loss, then again, we're looking at alternate diagnoses, such as perineural spread of a squamous cell carcinoma or a cerebellopontine angle tumor. Uh, another real red flag is if there's no response to medical therapy. And again, that would make me think that perhaps we're not dealing with trigeminal neuralgia. So the distribution of involvement, essentially any of the branches of the trigeminal nerve can be involved. And in the majority of patients, it's more than one branch. And that's the distribution uh, by percentage that you see on the screen. So in what situations would we do an MRI scan? Well, really the crucial thing about trigeminal neuralgia is the diagnosis is not made with an MRI scan. The diagnosis is almost entirely made on the history and the physical examination. The MRI scan is performed to look for other causes of facial pain. And if we're considering a surgical solution, then we're doing an MRI scan to look for compressive vessels at the origin of the trigeminal nerve. Uh, when we ask for imaging in a patient that we suspect has trigeminal neuralgia, we always ask for the very high resolution Fiesta sequences through the cerebellopontine angles where 
the T2 weighting acts as a contrast uh, so that we can see the arteries, veins and nerves within the uh, cerebellopontane angle cistern in great detail. So what are the other causes of facial pain that we need to uh, diagnose or exclude before we consider treating the patient as uh, idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia? I mean, certainly there can be tumors of nerves uh, and they can be primary or secondary tumors such as perineural spread or a trigeminal schwannoma. There can be tumors in the covering of the brain such as meningiomas, uh, multiple sclerosis uh, in many patients will present uh, with trigeminal neuralgia. There are other inflammatory conditions that sometimes cause facial pain. And then there's, of course, a vascular compression of the trigeminal nerves. So if we look at the imaging uh, literature, we'll find that approximately 1% of patients with classical trigeminal neuralgia, so that's the typical history and a normal neurological examination will have an underlying tumor. Uh, approximately 2% of patients with multiple sclerosis will develop or present with trigeminal neuralgia. And if you have bilateral facial pain, then there's approximately a 20% chance that the underlying diagnosis will be multiple sclerosis. And again, from a neurosurgical perspective, the MR imaging is very important in defining what, whether there's a vascular loop that could be causing the compression. So these are the sort of standard MRI scan pictures that we get. So these are adjacent slices that are T2. And again, you can see on the right-sided panel, you can uh, only just make out the trigeminal nerve. If we ask for these very high-resolution sequences, then we can basically Mark, see... Mark, excuse-moi. Uh, sure. Pour les traducteurs, il faudrait que tu parles un tout petit peu plus lentement. Could you please speak a bit slower for the French translation, Mark? Thank you. Sure, no problem. Uh, so on the uh, high resolution sequences, essentially we can see the origin of the trigeminal nerve uh, on this image. And then the trigeminal nerve is seen throughout its course, extending down to the bottom right hand corner. So we essentially have uh, 10 slices through the trigeminal nerve, which is uh, the sort of detail that we need if we wanna see evidence of vascular compression, such as the loop of the superior cerebellar artery that we see here. Uh, so the thin cut Fiesta sequences are what we ask for, and they're not normally part of a routine MRI scan. So these are some of the uh, patients that I've seen that have uh, presented with facial pain. Uh, and in many of these patients, there were some other subtle neurological signs that went along with it, but ultimately the underlying diagnosis of the facial pain proved to be something different. So this is a patient with a trigeminal nerve schwannoma causing significant brainstem compression and that patient had some sensory loss. Uh, again, you can have meningiomas in the cerebellopontine angle. And again, you can see this tumor is impinging upon uh, the course of the trigeminal nerve as it leaves the brain stem. Uh, this is a patient with multiple sclerosis. And again, you can see the trigeminal nerve here. And we have plaques of demyelination involving the trigeminal nucleus within the brain stem. And again, this can be a cause of trigeminal neuralgia. So we need to look carefully at the MRI scan to see whether the underlying diagnosis is correct. So on the high resolution MRI scan, these are the very detailed images that we see of the trigeminal nerve. And on these scans, you can see there's no sign of compression. Uh, this is a patient who does have trigeminal neuralgia due to vascular compression. And you can only just make out the trigeminal nerve on the standard T2 weighted sequence. But when we perform the high resolution study, this is again the same patient. You can see at the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve, there is a loop of the superior cerebellar artery that is bifurcated just before reaching the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve. And there are two points of vascular compression along the course of the trigeminal nerve just adjacent to the root entry zone. And again, what we see on the MRI scan corresponds uh, very directly with what we see at surgery. So in this patient, uh, the trigeminal nerve origin is here and here. And I was initially worried that the vascular compression may have been related to this very dolichoectatic basilar artery, which is running transversely. But when one looks closely, it's in fact a loop of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery that's been dragged up 
and decompressing this was not particularly difficult. So this is the operating microscope view into the cerebellopontine angle. That's the dolicoectatic basilar artery that's very atheromatous running transversely. But the trigeminal nerve, which we see on the right of the screen, is compressed by this loop of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. And again, decompressing it was not particularly difficult. Uh, and again, this is another patient where we have, um, uh, on this occasion, uh, a, a small loop of the superior cerebellar artery visible on the MRI scan. And again, this is the operating microscope view looking into the left cerebellopontine angle. So this is the uh, vestibular cochlear nerve with the facial nerve in front, the trigeminal nerve to the right, and as expected, a relatively small loop causing the vascular compression. Uh, and again, another patient with a very small uh, Interestingly, meningioma here that we can see on the MRI scan, but the, the cause of the uh, trigeminal neuralgia is again a vascular loop at the root entry zone. So one of the uh, inconvenient truths about trigeminal neuralgia is that there are some patients with classical trigeminal neuralgia that have no neurovascular conflict on high resolution MR imaging or a thorough exploration. So when I started as a neurosurgeon uh, in the late 90s, we would occasionally explore uh, patients uh, through a microvascular decompression and we'd find no evidence of vascular compression. With modern MR imaging, that almost never happens. And these days, if I can't see vascular compression on the MRI scan, we no longer explore the root entry zone because we can get just as an effective treatment with a percutaneous procedure. So again, if we go back and look at the uh, imaging literature, although the vascular compression in trigeminal neuralgia is frequently arterial, uh, it needs to be at the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve, but there's certainly a proportion of pain-free patients that have the same trigeminal nerve root pathology uh, with vascular compression that never developed trigeminal neuralgia. So if we look at autopsy studies, uh, in patients with trigeminal neuralgia, 90 to 100% of them will have evidence of vascular conflict at the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve. But if we look at patients who on their history have never complained of trigeminal neuralgia, somewhere between one in eight and two out of three patients will have some evidence of vascular compression that's never caused a problem. Again, with MR imaging, we will see arterial vascular conflict in a third of patients, up to a third of patients with no evidence of facial pain. So given the relative rarity of trigeminal neuralgia, there are probably 400 people with vascular compression of the trigeminal nerve for each patient who actually develops trigeminal neuralgia. And again, the pathophysiology is not completely understood. Uh, this really goes back to my point that the history is the key to making the diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia, and we really can't depend upon the imaging. Uh, and again, we have to remember that not, not all face pain is related to trigeminal neuralgia. And the further we deviate away from the classical description of trigeminal neuralgia, the less likely we are to be effective in treating trigeminal neuralgia with neurosurgical techniques. So what are the treatment options for trigeminal neuralgia? I mean, as you all know, medication is effective in the vast majority of patients with trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, the medication can be oral and usually the best drug is carbamazepine. In fact, we find that Tegretol is actually a positive predictor of a good outcome from microvascular decompression if the pain progresses. Uh, the second line drug that we would use would be pregabalin or Lyrica. And occasionally patients will find benefit from topical preparations, especially those with capsaicin in them. In terms of neurosurgical solutions for trigeminal neuralgia, there are a variety of percutaneous procedures such as glycerol injection, uh, balloon compression or radiofrequency lesioning. Uh, we can use microvascular decompression, which is often a very effective but quite invasive operative procedure. Uh, stereotactic radiosurgery, which is less popular in Australia than it is in the United States and Europe. Uh, and again, neurostimulation, particularly motor cortex stimulation, has an important role in the management of trigeminal neuralgia. And I'll 
I'll explain why that's the case shortly. So this is, you know, really one of uh, my favorite slides for trigeminal neuralgia because it really helps us find our place in history in terms of the management option of trigeminal neuralgia. So for those of us born in the 60s, you know, prior to that time, there was relatively little uh, in the way of effective treatment for trigeminal neuralgia. So you can imagine that patients, you know, in the 19th century uh, and early part of the 20th century would suffer from this condition without effective relief. Uh, so Tegretol was first used for trigeminal neuralgia only in 1963. Uh, the microvascular decompression procedure that was originally described by Dr. Janetta, who was a neurosurgeon in Pittsburgh, that only became popular in the 1960s. Uh, glycerol injection as an effective treatment for trigeminal neuralgia was discovered by chance in the early 1980s. And the more modern treatments such as uh, Neurontin, Epilim, uh, Pregabalin, and stereotactic radiosurgery only became available in the 1990s and early 2000s. So again, the treatment options that we have now are all relatively new. So the percutaneous techniques for trigeminal neuralgia can be either glycerol rhizolysis, radiofrequency lesioning, and balloon compression. Uh, they all have a fairly rapid onset of efficacy when they are uh, effective. And for me personally, I tend to use either glycerol injection or balloon compression. Uh, I've moved a little bit away from radiofrequency lesioning because I think that has a much higher chance of causing anesthesia. Uh, the mechanism of action is all quite similar in that each of those three procedures are designed to destroy the axons and myelin uh, through um, placing a needle through the foramen ovale into Meckel's cave. So with glycerol, it's a chemical injury to the trigeminal ganglion. With balloon compression, it's a pressure injury to the trigeminal ganglion. And with radiofrequency lesioning, it's a heating of the trigeminal neuralgia, uh, a tr trigeminal ganglion. But each of those uh, cause the same histological changes in that we see evidence of demyelination, endoneural fibrosis, and some neuronal loss. And if we test these patients with electrophysiology, we find that we are in fact causing uh, an effective electrical uh, injury to the trigeminal ganglion. So as I mentioned, glycerol was found by chance uh, in the 1980s in Sweden. Glycerol was used as the carrier that was uh, for tantalum, which was used as a localizer in stereotactic radiosurgery. So that was developed initially in Sweden. And what they found was that many patients uh, had a sustained release, relief of their facial pain uh, following the glycerol injection, even before they got to the radiosurgery. Uh, and that has gone on to prove to be one of the effective percutaneous procedures. So uh, this is basically uh, how the procedure is done, whether we um, use glycerol, a balloon, or radiofrequency lesion. Essentially, we place a spinal needle or a dwell cath <clears throat> um, through the cheek. We do the procedure now with stereotactic guidance. So we cannulate the foramen ovale by passing a needle uh, through the cheek up through the foramen ovale and into Meckel's cave. And we monitor the passage of the needle tip with uh, stereotactic image guidance and also with continuous lateral fluoroscopy. And this is the sort of uh, picture that we get. So you can see the foramen ovale is here, uh, just at the junction of the clivus with the petrous temporal lobe. And this is the needle positioned within Meckel's cave. And we uh, know the needles in the correct position, not only from the imaging studies, but also we can get CSF back in the majority of patients. Uh, so for me personally, I think the percutaneous procedures work particularly well in older patients who wish to avoid major surgery. Um, I found it very effective for patients who have perineural invasion, such as invasive squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, it's become the procedure of choice for trigeminal neuralgia associated with multiple sclerosis. Uh, and it's particularly effective in older patients or patients with malignancy. Uh, it's also very effective in patients that have failed microvascular decompression. 
Uh, one of the downsides to it, though, is that the recurrence rate is high. So I generally tell patients that there's approximately a 30% chance that their pain will recur over a three to five year period. Uh, but the procedure can be repeated, whether that's repeating the glycerol injection, repeating the balloon compression, uh, or repeating the radiofrequency lesioning. Uh, and good results are seen in approximately uh, two thirds of patients. What are the complications? Well, the most feared one is causing complete analgesia. So if we're too aggressive with the balloon compression uh, or also radiofrequency lesioning, we can cause analgesia in the face. Most patients note some degree of sensory change, although I found that with the balloon and glycerol having complete anesthesia is very uncommon. The most feared complication is anesthesia dolorosa. So they're patients who have complete numbness, but recurrent pain. Uh, there's a small risk that you could cause numbness of the cornea and a cornea ulcer can develop. There's a 2% chance of visual loss. You can occasionally have some patients develop some weakness in their bite muscle. Uh, and again, there's a small risk of cranial nerve palsy, particularly if the needle is malpositioned. There's a very small risk of causing meningitis and a very small risk of causing uh, a brain hemorrhage. Brain hemorrhage can occur for two reasons. One is when we're using balloon compression, we often see a very dramatic rise in the blood pressure associated with bradycardia. And uh, that does put some patients at risk of causing uh, a small intracerebral hemorrhage. So probably the most common neurosurgical procedure for trigeminal neuralgia is microvascular decompression. Uh, that's done under complete general anesthesia. And importantly, we now use continuous monitoring of hearing and facial movement. So all patients have brainstem auditory evoked potential monitoring and also facial nerve monitoring. Uh, we make a small craniectomy behind the ear, usually about two to three centimeters in diameter, open the dura, and then identify the trigeminal nerve as it leaves the brain stem. Uh, typically, patients spend one night in the intensive care unit, three nights in hospital, and most patients are back to work within two to six weeks. So the recovery is usually uh, quite good and quite rapid. So this is how we do the patient, uh, do the surgery. So this is a, a male patient. You can see that his uh, small amount of hair has been shaved. This is the uh, auditory evoke potential stimulating uh, probe that's in the ear so that clicks and with some electrodes in the scalp we can monitor the brainstem evoke potential uh, throughout the operative procedure and we perform a small craniectomy which usually goes through the mastoid and you can see the mastoid is being sealed with bone wax. Uh, the dura mater is opened and that exposes the cerebellum and then we introduce the operating microscope I always open at the inferior part of the cerebellopontine angle system that allows the cerebellum to relax. And that means we can perform the operation without a brain retractor. It's felt that the brain retraction is what's likely to cause hearing loss or facial weakness uh, due to a stretch injury. So in the first look, which is what we see in the top right hand panel, we can see the uh, spinal accessory nerve and the ninth and 10th nerves running into the jugular foramen. Uh, once we open the arachnoid here, we can look more superiorly. And that's what we see in this picture. And this is a fairly typical appearance. So again, the ninth nerve in the bottom right hand corner, the seventh and eighth nerves, which are the most lateral of the cranial nerves. And we have to work past them to the trigeminal nerve, which is partly obscured here. Uh, and again, this is now refocusing the operating microscope. Uh, we see the trigeminal nerve. We don't yet have a good idea of what's causing the compression because we have some arachnoid and some veins that are obscuring the field. Uh, once we cut away that arachnoid, we see what is the most common uh, cause of vascular compression in trigeminal neuralgia. So again, in the top left-hand corner, we see the trigeminal nerve. And there are two branches of the superior cerebellar artery that are causing compression on the anterior and superior aspect of the trigeminal nerve at its root entry zone. And again, this is again the most common anatomical finding at surgery. So we see the superior cerebellar artery running laterally. It's bifurcated just proximal to the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve. And what we want to do is we want to mobilize this artery and rotate it superiorly 
so that there's nothing compressing the trigeminal nerve. And that's what we're doing here. So this is again, the trigeminal nerve. And we can see that with the sucker, we're holding the superior cerebellar artery uh, superiorly. And what we're basically going to do is rotate it like the handle of a bucket from one side to the other. And then we just use a small piece of Teflon, which is what you can see here to hold the superior cerebellar artery up against the tentorial incisura so it can't move back down and the trigeminal nerve has been completely decompressed. Uh, one of the anatomical uh, curiosities about the superior cerebellar artery is that it does not give any perforating branches to the brainstem in its cisternal course and that's what lets us rotate it superiorly out of the way. It's a different issue with the facial nerve where the anterior inferior cerebellar artery does uh, give some branches and it's more difficult to rotate it. Uh, and once we've decompressed the trigeminal nerve, we can close up. And what I normally do is just seal the skull with a piece of acrylic that's held there with a little titanium plate. Uh, again, this is another similar picture. Uh, uh, on this occasion, it's a left-sided uh, vascular compression, uh, facial nerve, trigeminal nerve, superior cerebellar artery on the top side, and anterior inferior cerebellar artery on the bottom side. So we've moved the superior cerebellar artery superiorly and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery inferiorly, and again, holding it away with some pieces of Teflon. Uh, and again, that's the patient that I showed before where it was actually a loop of the pica that was causing the problem. Uh, and again, when we repeat the imaging, um, after decompression, we can see that the trigeminal nerve is visualized. And then this is the uh, artifact from the Teflon. So what are the complications of trigeminal neuralgia uh, when treated by microvascular decompression? So there is a small risk of causing some facial sensory loss, but again, the uh, intention of the microvascular decompression procedure is to preserve the function of the trigeminal nerve, whereas with the balloon compression procedures, we're trying to injure it. So there's a small risk of hearing loss, approximately 1%, a small risk of facial weakness, about 1%. Uh, in my experience, this is closer to about 0.5% and I've never seen a patient with facial weakness. There is a small chance of other cranial nerve palsies. The fourth nerve uh, runs very close and there is a potential for some transient diplopia. There's a small risk of infection in any neurosurgical procedure, a small risk of a CSF leak and very small risks of stroke or death. Uh, so what are the results of microvascular decompression? Well, they're better than the percutaneous procedures. Uh, the procedure is more likely to be effective in the short term and also in the long term. So we say to patients with trigeminal neuralgia, considering microvascular decompression, that at 10 years, there's at least a 70% chance that they'll be pain-free and off medication. Uh, and this paper, which came out in 1996, really established microvascular decompression that a treat, as a treatment option that was safe, effective, and durable. However, it's not effective in every patient. Uh, there are certainly some patients with classical trigeminal neuralgia that have no sign of vascular compression. So this is not the solution for all patients with trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, we've seen that already. Uh, neural monitoring really has become uh, the standard of care and it makes the procedure very safe. We have an anesthetic team here at Westmead that does all of the neural monitoring for us. Uh, for trigeminal neuralgia, we always do brainstem or tree evoke potential. If we're doing redos, we monitor the facial nerve. And for hemifacial spasm, uh, the brainstem or tree evoke potential is crucial in protecting the hearing. And it also shows us whether the, it's effective. So for hemifacial spasm, which is uh, facial twitching rather than facial pain, we find that if we do a lateral spread monitoring, we can see that the activity in the facial nerve uh, returns to normal once the decompression is effective. And if we see the um, aberrant lateral spread pattern persisting, then that tells me that we haven't found the cause of the vascular compression. So unfortunately, uh, trigeminal neuralgia can recur despite uh, microvascular decompression, and there is certainly um, recurrence. However, it is an effective procedure and the most effective procedure that we have for trigeminal neuralgia. 
So if the pain recurs, uh, what are our strategies from a neurosurgical perspective? Again, we need to go back and say, is it trigeminal neuralgia now? And was it ever trigeminal neuralgia? We need to be sure that the diagnosis was correct. Again, we go back and look at the imaging and see whether there was compression uh, that's residual or recurrent. Uh, and again, reevaluate whether there was severe compression in the first interest instance. Uh, we would go back and look at what medications have been trialed. And again, the patient's expectations are important. Uh, Teflon granulomas can occur after microvascular decompression, especially if the Teflon is touching the dura. And as uh, my career has progressed, I've certainly seen some patients develop Teflon granulomas that have caused the same pain uh, as the original trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, I'm just going to move through this because I want to speak a little bit about um, the stereotactic radiosurgery and the uh, neuromodulation techniques. And I realized that I'm speaking a little bit more slowly than I did in the practice, and I'll run out of time if I'm not careful. So stereotactic radiosurgery or gamma knife is usually performed by radiation oncologists. Uh, a single fraction of photon-based radiation is delivered to the root entry zone of the trigeminal nerve, uh, and that can be a very effective treatment for trigeminal neuralgia. The important points are is that it doesn't cause uh, relief of pain immediately. So we have to counsel the patients that it often takes three to six months for the radiation to cause an effective scar in the trigeminal nerve. Uh, it's a completely outpatient procedure not performed under anesthetic. A relatively large dose of radiation is given to the trigeminal nerve, um, but it's effective in 40 to 70% of patients at three years, depending on whose series that you look at. So for patients, particularly older patients that require therapeutic anticoagulation, stereotactic radiosurgery is a good option for trigeminal neuralgia. Uh, so let's think a little bit about neurostimulation for central pain. So basically, neurostimulation is based on the rationale that deafferentiation pain states uh, arise from a loss of sensory input into the somatosensory thalamic relay nucleus or the sensory cortex. And an interest in developing or stimulating uh, somatosensory pathways within the central nervous system has been around now for over 30 years. And that can be a, uh, performed either through deep brain stimulation or through motor cortex stimulation. And to date, motor cortex stimulation seems marginally more effective for trigeminal neuralgia. So what's the theory behind motor cortex stimulation? So essentially we think that there is an antidromic or reverse activation of neurons in the sensory cortex and that we generate descending impulses that inhibit abnormal thalamic hyperactivity that allows, uh, that occurs secondary to the deafferentiation phenomenon. Uh, motor cortex stimulation on PET studies also activates the nucleus uh, ventralis naturalis in the anterior thalamus. And we have found that motor cortex stimulation can also lead to an improvement in spasticity or tremor. Uh, its effect is not completely understood in that it does appear to also activate the anterior cingulate gyrus and insular cortex in PET studies. Uh, so again, it, its uh, effect is not completely understood. But we do know that it is dependent upon the somatotopic organization of the cortex. And it's really for that reason that motor cortex stimulation can be effective for uh, facial pain. So if we go back to our uh, image of the... Mark, il te reste deux, trois minutes encore. Okay. Mark, you have two to three minutes left. No problem. Uh, so this is the homunculus. And as you can see, a vast area of the lateral uh, cortex is devoted to um, sensory input for the face. And it's really for that reason why I think motor cortex can be uh, a good indication, uh, why trigeminal neuralgia can be a good indication for motor cortex stimulation. Uh, so it's effective not only in uh, trigeminal neuropathic and deafferentiation pain, it has a role in all of these other causes of central pain. So it's effective for thalamic pain, bulbar pain, uh, post hepatic neuralgia, and it also has a role in phantom limb and stump pain, especially if it's the upper limb. Uh, so 
where would we use motor cortex stimulation for facial pain? So it's probably really the only effective treatment for anesthesia dolorosa. It has a role in trigeminal neuropathic pain, deafferentiation pain, and atypical facial pain. Uh, deep brain stimulation involves putting an electrode into the thalamus that's then committed to a, a pulse generator very similar to the devices used for Parkinson's disease. And we put the electrode in the opposite sensory thalamus. Uh, the deep brain stimulation, again, can be performed as a two-stage or one-stage procedure. For pain, it's often performed as a one-stage procedure. Uh, epidural motor cortex stimulation is uh, performed through a small craniotomy, uh, performed over the contralateral sensory motor cortex, and we place an epidural electrode grid, uh, and then we stimulate directly. We can be sure we're in the right spot with image guidance and some other sensory evoked potential monitoring. Uh, and again, this is how we do it in the operating theater. Uh, so this is the um, paddle electrode that's placed over the uh, motor cortex and we can orientate the motor cortex very precisely using the image guidance system. And we can also use epidural stimulation to be sure in the right spot. Uh, and what we find is that if there is a 50% reduction with test stimulation, and we then go on and implant the neurostimulator. And again, this is what it looks like surgically. Um, I was going to show you a case study, but I think I'll skip through that just because we're short on time and I'd be happy to answer some questions. So this is one of my patients that's had every treatment for trigeminal neuralgia, uh, including motor cortex stimulation. And with motor cortex stimulation, he's been pain-free. So these are roughly the outcomes that we can have Expect with motor cortex stimulation uh, for thalamic origin pain, about half the patients will get excellent pain relief with motor cortex stimulation. Um, and that's been repeated in several studies now. Uh, for peripheral deafferentiation pain, again, 50% uh, good response. And that's basically what I counsel patients with trigeminal neuropathic pain. So again, it's not commonly performed. There's only about 100 cases in the literature now. Uh, but good to excellent responses can be expected in 50 to 75% of patients, and that probably reflects the cortical area dedicated to face pain. Uh, the potential complications, um, there's a small risk of a hematoma developing, a small risk of seizures, very small risk of causing language uh, and speech dysfunction, which is a dysarthria, and again, all of the device-related complications. Uh, the advantage is that it's very effective in reducing face pain that's been refractory to everything else. Uh, we see an increase in the level of patient's activity, a reduction in their narcotics, and the other advantage is that it's reversible. Uh, the disadvantage is uh, that it's invasive, it's expensive, uh, and it doesn't work in everyone. So just to finish with one final summary slide, uh, these are the sort of neurosurgical interventions that we can consider for trigeminal neuralgia. So in terms of success, microvascular decompression, the most successful. In terms of the rapidity of onset, uh, microvascular decompression and percutaneous procedures, we expect an immediate improvement in pain. With SRS, it takes three to six months. And with motor cortex stimulation, it always requires some uh, reprogramming of the device. In terms of the invasiveness of the procedure, microvascular decompression, the most invasive, and uh, stereotactic radiosurgery, the least invasive, uh, which is a completely outpatient procedure. And in terms of preserving facial sensation, uh, microvascular decompression and motor cortex stimulation usually result in no change in the patient's sensation. Uh, so I hope that's been informative and I would be uh, very happy to take some questions. Dr. Dexter, thank you for your presentation. I haven't met you yet. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Michel here in Namir. I've been here for a year and a half or so. I have a few questions I would like to put to you. Do you think that the results in terms of trigeminal surgery are partly linked to how quickly you start treating the issue if 
deep if decompression is done late then you could have residual neuropathic pain and nervous disorders how do you manage patients uh, uh, in those situations how long does it take for you to start treating them and how does the time factor operate do you get to the stage where it's no longer worth operating on these patients because the compression has been going on, going on for too long and surgery you won't fix it um, that's a great question. So there is good evidence that the outcomes of microvascular decompression are better in patients with a shorter duration of history. Um, however, we would still offer microvascular decompression even with patients that have had pain for 10 years. Uh, but we do know that the outcomes will be better in patients who uh, have surgery within the first two to five years from diagnosis. Having said that, however, if you're a you know older patient and your pain is very well controlled with carbamazepine and you're not having any significant side effects, then with most of those patients we are happy to continue with medical therapy. Um, so you know it's a great question. Uh, if the pain's refractory, absolutely, I would suggest moving to surgery early. But if the pain is well controlled with medical therapy, most patients would continue with medical therapy for many years. I was quite surprised here when I heard about a relatively long treatment period because we deal with patients from Wallis Island and the Loyalty Islands who come in when their symptoms are highly advanced in terms of their lumbar region, they've had symptoms and pain for years. My idea was that we should try and operate on these people in the first year of the onset of signs to avoid um, residual neuropathic consequences. But I've realized that even if you uh, manage these patients uh, very quickly, if you like, or you, you uh, go to surgery quickly, you, and, well, even if you don't, you still get very good results. And that is a bit contradictory as compared to what I see in some of the studies. I, I would agree with that. And it's certainly, um, there are cultural factors that uh, impact upon a patient's decision to proceed with surgery. And I've certainly had that same experience with the patients from uh, Loyalty and Wallace Island. Certainly the biggest tumours that I treat in Sydney are the patients from Wallace Island. I also have a final question. In your pre-operative, of operational consultation are you saying whether you're optimistic or pessimistic there are various ways of going about a consultation you could tell a patient you've got uh, you're going to have 30 or 50 percent pain residual pain and uh, or sometimes you come into you can come into it go into it in an optimistic way and, and suggest a better outcome could be obtained that's the way i tend to go about it and if you are optimistic, I think you improve the treatment outcomes and you can involve factors which are not strictly medical or necessarily always involved. Uh, I would agree with that completely. And certainly for trigeminal neuralgia, you know, I found microvascular decompression to be just uh, such an effective treatment option that I'm usually tending to be quite enthusiastic when I'm discussing that as a treatment option. Any other questions in the uh, conference room here in uh, Numia? Yes. Berlin Carrefour, director of the health division in CPS. I have been working with Rex for many over many years. And I wanted to ask that uh, they say the transition of a surgeon to a senior surgeon is when they know when not to cut. So in cases like this, when would you not cut? When um, would you not perform surgery? Uh, I am always reluctant to offer surgery if there are a lot of the red flags in the history. So, you know, if I don't think that this is classical trigeminal neuralgia, 
then again, I'm more cautious in recommending an invasive operative procedure. So if the history is atypical, if the imaging is uh, not as I would expect, then there will all be situations in which I would be reluctant to recommend uh, a surgical intervention. Thank you, Mark, very much for your presentation. I look forward to meeting you in person for further exchanges on issues other than just uh, neurosurgery and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great honor. Thank you very much. It was a great honor to be invited and I, I hope to be in New Caledonia in September and to catch up with many old friends then. So I wish you uh, uh, best wishes for the rest of the conference and I'm so sorry that I could not be there in person. Thank you.